Unplugged In, the remake of an American movie about a heroic Chinese girl has also found its way into the U.S.-China economic debate. There's only one way that a film can get made in China, and that's with the approval of the Chinese government. With hundreds of millions in China willing to pay for movies, how far does Hollywood go to meet the demands of the Chinese audience? But what's happening now is the CCP is saying, we don't want that sensitive stuff shown anywhere in the world. An economic and cultural rivalry. I'm plugged in. China versus Hollywood. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from Washington, D.C. A just-released movie touches on several sensitive areas of the already tense relationship between the United States and China. Disney's live-action remake of the animated classic Mulan cuts beyond concerns about China's influence on movie scripts and storylines. The movie release is also putting a spotlight on human rights abuses of Chinese Uyghurs. From Los Angeles, VOA's Elizabeth Lee explains. The pandemic is dealing a sickening blow to Hollywood. Theaters in key U.S. cities, such as New York and Los Angeles, remain shut. With COVID, if the U.S. box office doesn't recover, the Chinese box office could overtake it this year. China, the second largest movie market, is seeing a surge in ticket sales since movie theaters started reopening in July. COVID has now made China even more important to Hollywood. Chris Fenton, the former president of Motion Pictures for China-based DMG Entertainment, says even before the pandemic, Hollywood has been working hard for years to get into the Chinese market. Hollywood said, you know what, we need to at least think about sensitive topics when it comes to China, for instance, Tiananmen Square or Taiwan or Tibet. Um, so that at least has been a premeditated censorship by Hollywood starting in 1997. But the CCP's encroachment on fully operating inside the creative guidelines of what Hollywood does day to day has gotten more and more extensive over time. Jeez. But even with careful crafting of films, doing business in China has its perils. Does she's both beautiful and strong. Disney had high hopes for its movie Mulan. When Hollywood has been criticized for years for casting white actors to play Asian roles, Mulan has a predominantly Chinese cast, including actors Jet Li and Donnie Yen. We wanted to make sure we had a full, 100% Chinese cast, um, particularly because we've seen the backlash of films that have not followed that protocol. The movie's release was delayed because of the pandemic, now that the film is finally being streamed in the U.S. and released in Chinese theaters, there is controversy as viewers noticed some of the movie was filmed in Xinjiang, with credits thanking government entities there, where China is accused of human rights violations with mass detentions of the Muslim Uyghurs. I think the issue is that we don't have visibility into why Xinjiang was chosen and no one is willing to talk about it. This comes after the Chinese-American actress who plays Mulan supported the Hong Kong police on social media last year during the mass demonstrations in Hong Kong against China's increasing control. I think she is Mulan in the modern times. From Thailand and South Korea to the U.S. and on social media, people have been calling for a boycott of Mulan. Disney has not responded for a request for a comment. Disney's troubles come at a time of political tensions between the U.S. and China. The New York Times reports the Trump administration is considering a ban on cotton products from Xinjiang. A Chinese spokesman says the U.S. is using human rights as an excuse to destabilize Xinjiang. Xinjiang-related matters are not about rights, ethnicity or religion, but about countering violence, terrorism and separatism. The U.S. has no right or qualification to interfere. In the midst of the Mulan backlash, Reuters reports Chinese authorities have told media outlets in China not to cover the release of Mulan in China. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Los Angeles. For context, let's put some numbers to what we're talking about. In 2019, Americans spent the most worldwide, spending a little more than $11 billion going to the movies. Chinese moviegoers spent nearly $10 billion, which is nearly five times more than third place Japan. 
According to the consulting firm PwC, China generates more box office dollars than the next six markets combined. And with many U.S. theaters closed due to the pandemic, by the end of this year, China could surpass U.S. movie revenue. China operates more than 60,000 movie screens, compared to about 40,000 in the U.S. Chinese films make 80 to 90 percent of their revenue from ticket buyers in local theaters. In contrast, American films get less than 30 percent of revenue from movie attendance. Theme parks and merchandise licensing that accompanies the films accounts for most of the rest. In 2019, of China's 25 highest grossing films, 17 were made in China and eight were American made. With China poised to become a global movie powerhouse, what does it mean for Hollywood and the future of the U.S. film industry? Chris Fenton is a Hollywood executive and author of the book Feeding the Dragon, Inside the Trillion Dollar Dilemma Facing Hollywood, the NBA, and American Business. I asked him about China's growing influence on Hollywood and its films. China is probably the most important market outside of the United States, and next year it will probably be the most important market, which means it will be the largest box office generator around the world, including that of the United States. Well, there's no question here in the United States. We have a First Amendment and we have a great respect for arts and, and artists will oftentimes, and this include movie makers, make movies that are critical of the United States. And we see that all the time. Um, will Hollywood make today or can it make a movie today that's critical of China that will also be shown in China? Well, first of all, a movie a movie that's critical of China in some way, Hollywood would technically just say, you know what, we're not going to worry about the China market for this. We're going to make it for the rest of the world. And they operated that way for quite some time. Red Dawn was sort of the end of that because Red Dawn used the Chinese uh, as the enemy in that movie and ultimately the one that the protagonist defeated in the film. Um, China was very upset about that because the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, was the enemy that was uh, shown in the film. And when China heard about that film, MGM and Sony were like, hey, you know what? It's OK. We're not making that movie for China. The economics work for the rest of the world. Except China didn't agree with that. They said, we don't want that movie shown anywhere in the world. So we're going to shut you out of our market unless you change it. And that's exactly what they forced. So the First Amendment right, which you brought up, is completely dampered by the way the CCP is operating beyond its borders. It's one thing to say, hey, we're not going to show what you want to show in our market because there are certain things that we feel are sensitive for our populace. And Hollywood placates to that, just like they do with Japan or South Korea or in the Middle Eastern countries. But what's happening now is the CCP is saying, we don't want that sensitive stuff shown anywhere in the world. We don't want that flight jacket that Tom Cruise is wearing in the latest Top Gun movie to have the Taiwanese and Japanese flag on it, not just in our country, but also in Argentina and in Germany and in the United States. And that's where the real issue lies. But does Hollywood appease China now for money? It's all about the dollar. That's what it is. Unfortunately, that is what it is. And, and, and there's a simple solution to it. And it used to be sort of the way I think people on the right and the left and in between thought about things here in America and in other countries, which was patriotism before capitalism. That was a simple, simple concept. Like, let's do something that's good for the people first and then let's be free market capitalists. And that's the way we got to get back to, because right now, and I was completely complicit for it, um, you know, over 20 years. And in fact, it wasn't until the GM of the Houston Rockets, Daryl Morey, tweeted something where um, the NBA was thrown out of that market. And I woke up to it going, wait, the American public are mad about the way the NBA has been behaving over there. They've been kowtowing to the CCP. That's weird. Oh, wait, I've been doing that in Hollywood as a cog in the wheel. Huh, that's interesting. And I never thought about it because it was always a mission of globalism, a mission of opening China to the products and services of America, um, no matter what it took. Like that was in the best interest of all Americans. That was in the best interest of the world. That was the globalist mission. The problem is, is now we've seen that move a lot of our manufacturing offshore. 
we've sold off a lot of our or had IP rights stolen or tech patents stolen. We've been in, forced into JVs. We have an unlevel playing field when it comes to trade because they're seen as a developing nation while we're a developed nation. There's all kinds of problems with it. So we need to address those. All right. Let me talk about uh, Disney's new release, Mulan, which is a remake. Um, uh, tell me what your thoughts are about that. What they tried to do with Mulan was to make an IP that was based on legend and mythology that was fully Chinese, that had been made many times in the various versions of Chinese movies and television series, and to Disneyfy it and to make it into a huge Hollywood production. The problem with doing that is that in order to get the access to the resources and the locations and all the other privileges that you need to make that movie, you have to placate the government in many different ways. Um, on top of it, to get access to the locations where they wanted to shoot it, and in fact, they used some of the same locations that they used in a movie called Kite Runner a few years ago, um, out in the Xinjiang province, which is where the Uyghur atrocities are occurring. And to get that access, they had to go through the same entities that are the ones responsible for the atrocities that all of us are appalled by. Um, not only that, but as protocol, and I know it from making Looper or Iron Man 3, you need to credit those entities and credit those individuals that work for those entities in the end crawl of the movie. But who chose that area? Who chose the area? Was it, was it imposed upon Disney or did Disney say, okay, we want to shoot some of this there? Well, I can tell you, I, I, I wasn't part of that production, but I can tell you in a very sort of similar manner when we did a sports program for ESPN called the World's Strongest Man Competition, we wanted to shoot it in Beijing. And the CCP was very adamant that we use the backdrop of a city they wanted to showcase around the world called Chengdu. And this was back in 2005 when no one had heard of that city um, instead. So they do force their will on what they want to have seen in a particular form of content, which carries that message. So. Without knowing for sure, I would say that uh, if history repeats, you're 100% right, that they were forced to use that as a backdrop, which was something that Disney shouldn't have treaded into. The problem is, and it's the same thing the NBA had, is that if Bob Iger stands up and says something, or if Disney stands up and says something, it just becomes a sacrificial lamb, and Bob gets replaced by some CEO that keeps his head in the sand, or Disney gets replaced by Universal over there, or maybe Telemunchen out of Germany. The only way it changes is if there's some sort of unified front backing what is very important to Americans, which is First Amendment rights. We should have the right on our soil to back what we think is right in regards to a controversy between Hong Kong and the CCP. And we should have, as Hollywood unified, backed Disney into allowing them to say what we all wanted them to say, which was, hey, we don't think what's right is happening to Hong Kong right now, and we don't believe in what our lead actors in Mulan are saying. But we also don't expect you to retaliate for us exercising our free rights and all of Hollywood should have come behind Disney and said, you know what, if you retaliate against them, you're retaliating against all of us. Six months ago, New York City was the U.S. epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, preparations are underway to reopen the theaters. But it is an uphill battle for cautious New Yorkers who have grown accustomed to social distancing. For those reluctant to go to the movie theater, the Lincoln Film Society will bring the movies to them. Plugged In's Mill Arcega explains. A summer evening outdoors. No need for face masks or a temperature check. And with the Manhattan skyline as the backdrop, any movie is a date night masterpiece. With the world that we live in now and social distancing, this is an easy date while still social distancing. So, dating 2020. COVID, like you can't go to the movies, you can't go in anywhere else. It's like a chance to sit out here and take in a movie and see like the skyline and just something different. With New York City still in recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, most of the city's theaters remain closed for now. Right now it's closed along with our film center and it hasn't been open since March 12th. 
Leslie Kleinberg is the executive director of the Lincoln Center Film Society. She has yet to receive any instructions from city or state authorities on how to reopen, but a lot of work is being done in preparation. Ventilation systems have been refurbished, and the society's film collection is growing. Because normally we'd be restricted to the physical theaters, and so now we can actually program, you know, eight or nine films at a time. The city's annual film festival opens later in September. Kleinberg says all the movies will be shown in New York's open spaces. We want the New York Film Festival to be a real festival of New York. Uh, normally we actually have the festival exists only within the confines of 65th Street. And this year going out into the city uh, is very significant for us. We think film can be a way for the city to open up, um, for people to come out and enjoy the arts again. Chain movie theaters around New York City still display posters from March. But most are hoping to update and reopen soon with a few big adjustments. Most theaters will only be allowed to operate at 30 to 50 percent capacity. Ventilation systems have been revamped. Auditoriums will be thoroughly cleaned before each screening. And to entice more viewers, some theater chains are promising to charge only 15 cents, the price of admission 100 years ago. Smaller private theaters may have a harder time adjusting to the new reality, but they're working on setting up more online screenings. For now, the drive-in theater, a throwback to the past, is making a comeback. It may be the only safe option for New Yorkers right now, and until fall, when the cold weather returns, it may be the most enjoyable. For Nina Vishneva in New York City, Milar Sega, VOA News. The relationship between Hollywood and China is being scrutinized. A recent industry report found a growing trend of self-censorship by American movie studios. Anne Kokus studies the media and technology relationship between the United States and China. She's the author of the book, Hollywood Made in China, which explores how the Chinese market has transformed the American media industry. We spoke about the broader cultural and economic impact of the race to dominate the global box office. Who do you get has the upper hand in this relationship with movies, China or Hollywood? So for a long time, Hollywood studios had the upper hand because they had more technology, um, a bigger global market. And Hollywood studios are still by far the preferred, the preferred film venue uh, outlet for global films. So in Japan or in the UK or in France. Um, however, in the Chinese domestic box office, we're seeing Chinese, Chinese uh, consumers are much more interested in watching Chinese films. So we're looking at um, at nearly $10 billion last year, and it's catching up very quickly to the U.S. market. So I think that we really need to see what's going to happen with COVID. If this is truly an inflection point in which there is a substantially larger Chinese box office where production in China ramps up before production in Los Angeles ramps back up, then we may see this as a significant moment where the Chinese box office becomes the dominant force in the world. You have written that Beijing has deputized, I guess, it's either Hollywood or Disney in order to advance China's political interests and national narrative. What do you mean by that? So one thing I talk about in my book, Hollywood Made in China, is this idea of the faux production, where a lot of a lot of you know companies go in hot and they're excited about these co-produced films, and then as a process of engaging with the Chinese government, the amount of Chinese funding that they have to include, the amount of Chinese, the number of Chinese stars, the types of cuts. They pull out. Well, one thing that we see in the recent release, Mulan, is the way in which the idea of foreigners is framed. The space of Xinjiang is completely elided, and all that we see is an image of what the film refers to as the Silk Road, which actually evokes uh, the Belt and Road Initiative narrative that Xi Jinping has, prof has proffered and advanced in his foreign policy discourse. Would Mulan not be able to be uh, made and distributed in China, but for uh, essentially doing what China wanted in terms of removing certain things or portraying certain things in a particular way? Yeah, there's only one way that a film can get made in China, and that's with the approval of the Chinese government. Recent government regulations have shifted it so that um, government film approval is um, just below the level of the National People's Congress. So it's very high level approval. What we also saw in the film was that at the end, the credits actually thanked governmental bureaus in Xinjiang, where there are over one million Uyghurs allegedly held. And was that to tip a tip? Was that an acknowledgement of China to make China happy, CCP happy? 
Well, I think that it is an acknowledgement, and I think that that acknowledgement is really important. But what we see is that by choosing the by choosing to actually film in Xinjiang, Disney was participating in the system of oppression that's operating there. When we think of Xinjiang, we think of the Uyghurs. Right. I mean, many people do, and human rights violations. Um, could that movie have been made in any way, that Disney movie Mulan, could that have been made in any way and distributed in China, um, but for China telling them where to do it? So one thing that I think is important to note here is that there are a lot of deserts in China that do not that are not in Xinjiang. Um, so, for example, Inner Mongolia would be another filming location that would have those same kind of expansive desert vistas. So by choosing to actually work within that context, they were choosing to work with that government. With that government. Now, there's a boycott going on, hashtag boycott uh, Mulan, because the, one of the stars has gone on social media and has given positive words about the police in Hong Kong who have been stomping all over the protesters, uh, people who are protesting for democracy there. And now they've got this, this Twitter or the social media hashtag boycott the movie and it's, it's being supported in Hong Kong, Thailand, um, and Taiwan. Uh, does that have an impact on the Chinese government? So we're seeing it not just in those places, but in the US, in Japan, in Korea. Um, but frankly, the Chinese government is used to its neighbors pushing back against Chinese um, Chinese content control. So I don't think it affects the Chinese government. And frankly, we've seen a very muted response from Disney. Disney doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to rock the boat. Right. I mean, we saw in the we saw in the fall what happened when the NBA response to was to support the Hong Kong protesters um, or to support free speech about the Hong Kong protesters, and their games were um, were blacked out for a very long time. Um, now, I don't know how much pressure Disney was under um, or how much of a requirement it was for them to shoot in Xinjiang. Um, if it was you get to make the movie in China only if you shoot in Xinjiang or if it was just that they chose that because they thought the vistas were very beautiful and were willing to overlook the human rights abuses. You know, in the United States, we take great pride of the fact that we have First Amendment. We let artists do what, whatever they want. Um, an artist uh, does what he or she wants, and a, a director, a movie maker, is an artist. Um, in China, if you don't, in, if you don't do a positive view of China, what happens? Right. So that's a that's a problem in terms of distribution. So films that don't have a favorable vision of China would likely not be distributed within the Chinese market. You know, when you say it doesn't have a positive view of China, what if it just had you know an unattractive skyline? Would that be enough? So we have seen examples of unattractive skylines be cut out of films that are distributed in China. So for example, the case of Mission Impossible 3, there was an unattractive vision of Shanghai where there was laundry hanging in the street. Um, that was cut and the release was delayed by several months, cutting into the profit substantially. Do you ever hear Hollywood sort of putting down its foot and saying, we want that in there? Or does Hollywood do essentially what China wants? So the problem with a lot of this is that we don't have a lot of transparency into what happens in studios. So how films, how the films that are going to be made are chosen, what final cut looks like. Um, and that I think is the concern for the American people. It's not just Hollywood suffering big losses during the pandemic. New York City is the entertainment capital of the US East Coast. Live Broadway stage productions like The Lion King and Hamilton could remain on hold until next year. VOA's Anna Rice explains. Every year, more than 14 million people come to see one of New York City's famous Broadway shows. In 2019, these performances brought in well over $1.7 billion. But since March, the theaters have been empty, and Broadway could be facing a record-setting year-long break. Theater critic Michael Riedel believes the theaters won't spring back to life until there is a vaccine against COVID-19. There is no possibility of Broadway or concerts or anything live, any live events coming back until there's a vaccine. One, the actors can't do it because how are you going to do Romeo and Juliet when they both have masks on? It's going to, you know, kill the romance. Uh, the musicians do not want to be in the pit of an orchestra until they feel safe going there because, as you know, with the vaccine, if you're blowing on the flute, on the trombone, it's going to spread the virus. So they're not going to, to go back to work. The most popular Broadway shows like Hamilton, Phantom of the Opera and Lion King will likely survive the unprecedented break. 
but some of the less famous ones might have to close, and the sad process has already begun. The biggest one is, is Frozen, which is the Broadway um, show that was, was frozen, but the pandemic is not going to thaw it's done. Um, there are a couple others. But even those that survive will have to adjust to the new reality. The industry will have to review its pricing policy and compensation to those who work behind the scenes – musicians, set and lighting designers. You cannot reopen Broadway when there's a vaccine and say, hey, by the way, Hamilton's back on the boards and you pay $1,200 to see it. That's not going to happen. Ticket prices will have to come down to a reasonable level. But how to do that is a tough question for industry leaders. One of the oldest theater companies, the Schubert Organization, owns 17 theaters on Broadway. They were forced to furlough a lot of their employees, but have proven resilient over time. The Schubert Organization, which is the, uh, you know, the foundation of Broadway, the, the anchor of Broadway, uh, that has survived. The Schubert survived the Great Depression. <laughs> they survived September 11th. They survived the, um, uh, the collapse of New York City in the 1970s, when the city was perceived as so dangerous, nobody would want to come here. Uh, they survived certainly Hurricane Sandy. They have survived everything. Broadway isn't just about Broadway, but also New York City as well. The industry pumps money into the city and supports thousands of jobs. A vibrant theater industry funds hotels, restaurants and stores near Times Square. For many, when Broadway comes back, New York City is back, with all its hustle, bustle and shine. For Evgeny Maslov in New York, Anna Rice, VOA News. Before we go, Hollywood is still mourning the death of actor Chadwick Boseman. His starring role in the Marvel comic blockbuster film The Black Panther won Boseman worldwide acclaim. The 43-year-old actor died August 28th after a private four-year battle with cancer. ABC's Faith Abube has more on Bozeman's life and his legacy. Cancer robbed the world of another hero. What happens now determines what happens to the rest of the world. Taking 43-year-old rising Hollywood star Chadwick Boseman, the man who gave human form to Marvel's Black Panther. He died in Los Angeles, surrounded by his wife and family. According to the statement posted to his Instagram account, the actor was diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer in 2016, the diagnosis eventually advancing to stage 4. Colorectal cancer is the second deadliest cancer in the U.S., disproportionately affecting black and brown communities. And even more remarkable, Bozeman's family revealing the actor was making movies, starring in Spike Lee's The Five Bloods and playing a determined Thurgood Marshall during and between countless surgeries and chemotherapy. Give me a hand with these, would you? What have you got in here, cement? Guns. Books. Bozeman, a South Carolina native, worked his way up in the film industry, playing an impressive roster of black icons like Jackie Robinson in 42. It's from Leonard. James Brown in Get On Up. Before finding fame as T'Challa in Marvel's Black Panther. Bozeman tearing up during this interview about the movie while talking about two fans with terminal cancer. And their parents said they just, they're trying to hold on till this movie comes. Mm. And when I found out that they, whew, yeah, it's, it's, it means a lot. The stunning news of Bozeman's death sending social media into shock and grief Friday night, some using the actor's death as a reminder of the individual battles many fight silently. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. That's all the time we have this week. Thank you to my guests, Ann Kokus and Chris Fenton. And for more on these issues, visit our website at voanews.com. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Greta. And thank you for being plugged in.